Okay, folks, and welcome. I am Dr. Joanne Yanez. I'm the Executive Director for the Association of Accredited Naturopathic Medical Colleges, and I'm excited to have with us uh, Dr. Terrence Manning today. And uh, Dr. Manning is a specialist in interventional orthopedic and orthobiologic medicine with a focus in non-surgical treatment options for joints, tendons, and ligaments. Uh, Dr. Manlin currently serves as the vice president of the Naturopathic Orthopedic Medical Academy and is a founding member of that organization. Uh, I'm very excited to have him with us today. And uh, But before we begin, I just wanna go through a little bit of housekeeping. So if you can go to the next slide, Dr. Manning, please. So uh, all attendees today are going to be in listen-only mode. If you do have questions during the course of the webinar, please use the Q&A button down on the Zoom panel. Uh, if you have any difficulties, Joanna uh, is here and she can help as well. Uh, and you can also email us at any time at info at aanmc.org. And so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Manning and make my face go away, but I'll be here behind the scenes. Thank you for joining us. Great, thank you. So I think I'd start, um, Joanne introduced me pretty well there, and um, but uh, start with a little bit about my background, especially because um, some of you may be kind of in a time where you're completing your bachelor's program or uh, looking into health careers and looking into naturopathic medicine as a potential for that. So. Talking about my journey and how I got to where I am might be particularly of interest to you and might help inform your decision one way or the other. Um, as much information as you can gather as you're trying to make your decisions uh, probably will serve you well. I went to Western Oregon University straight out of high school and uh, with intentions of going into a conventional medical school. I went to that program specifically because there was a really small ratio faculty to student ratio and I knew that I could if I could have a really good undergrad experience and have direct access to the faculty that perhaps I could stand out in my medical school applications. In addition, uh, I as I started through the undergraduate curriculum, I started working at the local nursing home as a CNA. I did that Talk about being on the first lines in the medical field, being a CNA at a nursing home is just that. And I thought that this would help make me a real competitive applicant for getting into a conventional medical program. Upon graduation, I graduated top of my class, most outstanding graduate in the pre-med program, had done research and had experience as a CNA. But as I was thinking about making that step in getting my letters of recommendation together for applying to medical school, I had realized that throughout my experience and my interaction with the healthcare system, both as a patient and as somebody working within it, that I was disillusioned with the field. And ultimately, becoming a conventional doctor, at least at that time, didn't sound too appealing. So I kind of put a pause on my, on my plans and tried to try some other avenues and think about what might be the best fit for me. So much to the dismay of my family, in particular, my dad, I took a little detour and went to a liberal arts college to get a degree, master's degree in philosophy. Now, this move, my dad didn't really approve of because he didn't see the utility of it. He didn't see the career path for it. But for me, it, it meant the world. In that program, I learned a lot about why we do what we do and how knowing what we know can inform the decisions we make, not only in our personal life, in our professional life, but also in healthcare as a whole and in our uh, experience as a clinician. While I was at St. John's College, studying all these great minds and learning all these wonderful ideas and trying to see what might my, my future career be, I realized that in academia, thinking about thoughts and teaching them to each other is great, but it doesn't practically help people in the way that I wanted to help them. So I was lined up to go to a PhD program and continue, continue a career as an academic 
academician in philosophy, but decided that that probably wasn't really what was fueling me, driving me, what my I really wanted to do. Instead, funny enough, as I was working at St. John's College, I uh, had a part-time job in the career services department as an advisor for pre-medical students. And I happened to get this pamphlet in the mail um, and it had talked about the naturopathic profession and the, the whole uh, pamphlet was about alternative careers, alternative careers in the field of medicine. And in particular, the article on naturopathic medicine and the training and the rigors and the scientific and evidence base of nat naturopathic medicine really caught my eye. But when I read it, that article also talked about the difference between the naturopathic philosophy of medicine versus the allopathic or conventional paradigm that dominates most of healthcare right now. And I knew that was the fit. I knew I wanted to do that right then and there. And so I started my application for naturopathic medical school. Again, my father didn't really approve of that. He still wanted me to go to a conventional medical school. Yet, I knew that naturopathic medicine was the perfect combination for me to fulfill what I knew was the right way to treat people, the right way to make a difference in a person's life. And it allowed me the freedom to incorporate my understandings and my philosophies in an evidence-based way to help people. I applied to the National University of Natural Medicine and luckily got accepted and went through the four-year program there. While I was in school, I had a real open mind. I had no idea exactly what I wanted to do at the end. All I knew is that school is really beneficial and you learn a lot, but you really learn more by doing a residency. So I knew I wanted to do a residency. I just didn't know in what particular field or where I would find myself. As I was Finishing my fourth year, I applied to most of the residencies on the West Coast and had interviews at a lot of them, and there were some really great residency opportunities. Yet, my last residency, I got this email and from a prominent doctor in, in Portland here, and it said, hey, where are you? We're trying to interview you for the residency. The match day is next week. We need to meet. So I hightailed over there, and we met, and I saw the type of medicine that they were practicing. And I knew right then and there, that's what I wanted to do. Luckily, when match day came, I matched with that particular residency. They ranked me number one. I ranked them number one. And the rest is kind of history, as it were. Now, looking back retrospectively, I didn't know about the type of medicine that I currently practice when I was going through school. I didn't know about it until that residency interview. Yet some of my classmates had. And a lot of them were kind of gunning for this type of residency, and I was oblivious to it. But luckily, um, I, the cards fell into place, and, and here I am. So speaking of residency, uh, in the field that I particularly practice in, I did a one-year residency that was split between a naturopathic physician and a medical doctor. And then years two and three were with a medical doctor alone as my supervisor. As I was doing my postgraduate training, I added some a certification, and this is through the Alliance for Physician Certification Advancement. I received a certification in musculoskeletal ultra, ultrasound. So it's this um, professional distinction of this board exam that you have to take to kind of prove that when you're using ultrasound diagnostically and interventionally, that you actually know what you're looking at, know what you're doing. Really nice exam. And since then, since I've completed my training, I mean, we're always learning as we're clinicians, but completed the formal training, um, I have decided to try to help others in, in our profession to learn these types of skills and techniques. Naturopathic school and, and our naturopathic medicine, as you'll see, I'm very passionate about and has a very bright future, but we need to do a better job with postgraduate training. It is helping, it is working, but that is one of the reasons why I help form uh, the Naturopathic Orthopedic Medicine Academy, or NOMA, and currently serve as the vice president. So that's about me. Um, definitely wasn't a straight road to naturopathic medicine, and I was definitely skeptical many times along the path, 
but here I am now and I'm not looking back and happy that, that this is where it ended up. So before we get going too much further, I just wanted to give gratitude to some of my mentors and those I've learned from. Uh, not all these ideas are original to me and some of them I have gleaned from my wonderful residency supervisors and mentors in practice. So first and foremost is Dr. Rahul Desai. He's a conventionally trained interventional radiologist and he was my residency supervisor for three years. And then we have Dr. Noel Peterson. He's a naturopathic doctor. He's been in practice for quite a long time, a wealth of knowledge, and he is a living, breathing, walking example of naturopathic medicine. You can't get near him without knowing um, about vitality and about our principles of naturopathic medicine. And then luckily at school, um, I met the love of my life and she graduated as well. And so Valeria, Dr. Valeria Manning, thanks to her and my family, Lily and Maya, uh, for, you know, putting up with me, uh, sacrificing time away from them to put together talks like this and do my residency training and, and everything that I do. So really deeply uh, thankful to these people. So today what we'll talk about is um, a very high level approach. We're not going to get too much into the weeds about much of this, but I think you'll get the, the gist of the story and get an idea of um, how naturopathic medicine is a great career opportunity if you think it's the right fit for you. So first and foremost, I'll talk about what is naturopathic medicine. Not sure how familiar you are with that. I'll give you my perspective. You ask 10 different naturopaths what naturopathic medicine is, you'll probably get 10 different answers. So keep that in mind. Then we'll talk about more specifically what type of medicine I practice. So we'll talk about an introduction to basics of pain. Then we'll talk about conventional medicines approach. And then we'll talk about naturopathics medicine approach to pain and why regenerative medicine is a particularly synergistic and good fit. So what is naturopathic medicine? Well, not sure how familiar you are. You, you may have a lot of different ideas in your mind, but basically um, it is at the core, a patient-centered evidence-based approach to medicine with a unique philosophy of working with nature. So what I love about this is that we are trying to harness the bodies or natures or all of the vi vital energy that drives our organs, our organ systems, our cells, our organism, our ecosystem as a whole, working within that system to try to find a balance and thinking that that balance can then result in health. Now, there's many types of, of people who might be termed naturopaths. And here's one of the distinctions that I'd like to make about naturopathic doctors and practicing naturopathic medicine versus quote unquote naturopaths, right? Naturopaths, there are online certification programs, nothing against them, where you can take a couple weekend courses on botanical medicine or weekend courses on diet and nutrition and basically kind of become perhaps a health coach or a lay botanist or, uh, or something like that. But that's very different from the term of what I mean about naturopathic doctor. So some people I know, I work in a clinic with three other conventional doctors, and I've been here longer than two of them. And when they started, when they first came here, I know that they had in mind when they heard that I was a naturopathic doctor, that I might be more like this guy here, maybe somebody at the health food store who's trying to give you advice on which organic kale to buy over the other one, or perhaps like an indigenous healer, or shaman, or that type. Well, nothing wrong with those, but that's not necessarily a profession. That's not a, necessarily what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is naturopathic doctors. And to be a naturopathic doctor, um, you have to have a bachelor's degree, and then you have to go to one of the accredited naturopathic medical schools and pass that. Now, residency is an option. Um, it is not required, 
But one interesting thing to think about compared to our conventional colleagues is that um, conventionally, the allopathic programs, they have federal support and funding for their residency programs. And so for every graduate, there's a residency slot available. Now they may or may not get the one that they want, but at least it's available to them. In the naturopathic profession, that's a little bit different in the sense that most of these are privately funded or funded by naturopathic organizations and not the big support of federal government. Therefore, our residencies are actually more competitive. There are fewer residencies than there are graduates, and those graduates are applying to multiple residencies. Um, so they're, they're, they are quite competitive. Hopefully, we'll have more and more residencies, and we'll have more and more funding for these residencies. That's something I'm very passionate about and, and working toward as well. Um, al alone from getting through naturopathic school and passing all those exams and, and getting your degree, in order to be licensed in a state to practice, you have to pass the national, actually, I believe it's international um, licensing test uh, board exams. So the MPLEX-1 and MPLEX-2. So very similar path to become a naturopathic doctor as that of a conventional doctor. Here's a little bit more about that comparison where we have the NDs here, we have MDs and DOs here, and then you have nurse practitioners. And all of these, irregardless of their background of training, are trained in medical assessment and diagnosis, how to manage the patient, communication collaboration. Um, they have system-based practices and they practice evidence-based medicine. But one of the things that really caught my eye is when you look at the, the naturopathic program, we have um, similar hours to the MD and DO programs. And what I like to think of it is kind of like, well, we use the same textbooks, we study the same course, heck, most of our fac faculty in, in our schools are even MDs or DOs or DCs. So we're learning the same information and we're being held accountable for that information with exams and, and tests and board exams. But, but on top of that, we also learn botanical medicine, lifestyle medicine, physical medicine, nutrition. So it's almost like we get an MD or a DO training plus an addition to it. It's not that our training is insufficient or lacking, it's in addition to what most other healthcare practitioners will get. Okay, now on to pain. So hopefully you get a good idea of naturopathic medicine and what a naturopathic doctor is, but now we'll kind of focus in on what I've specialized in and, and what I am super passionate about, and that's pain. So pain is the original symptom. I mean, if you think about, and you can here goes the philosopher in me. Sorry if I ramble about this stuff. But if you think about some of the original texts about things of like caring for others and trying to heal, most of it starts with pain. And what is the most common reason somebody is actually going to go to a doctor? Pain. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be musculoskeletal pain in origin for them to come seek help. I do specialize in treating musculoskeletal issues, but that's not the only source of pain and that's not the only realm of where pain is coming from. But the thing to remember is that pain is a symptom, right? It is not the root cause of what is going on. So here we just have some pictures of, you know, person with chest pain. Well, that chest pain could be coming from the musculoskeletal system, or it could be coming from the cardiovascular system. We have um, here people with pain all over the body, it might be an autoimmune type of picture, and our good old knee pain and low back pain and foot pain, ankle pain. But this symptom of pain is the starting point of when and how people come to seek care. And that pain is there for a reason. We'll talk about that a little bit more. But if you look at our system and you, and you look at how we do as a country as a whole in taking care of these patients and all of these complaints of pain, it's not very good. 
a little bit more about pain. Um, the, the basics here, and if some of you have already received your bachelor's degree and taken anatomy and physiology, this might look really familiar. And you've, you've probably studied it more recently than I have. But basically, you have this source of to either tissue injury or inflammation, whether that inflammation is coming from tissue injury, infection, foreign body, um, other types of things. You have this primary source, and then um, that, that source of where the tissue damage is happening is not perceived as pain until it interacts with a nerve. And then the nerves, the nervous system, communicates that signal to the spinal cord up the spinal thalamic tract into the central nervous system and the perception of pain is actually in our central nervous system and in our brain even though the area of injury is somewhere remote or different from that so understanding this is really important and, and one of the keys is that our bodies are connected and we have nerve sensory everywhere. Now, just because oftentimes people think of nerve issues as only being a motor nerve problem. Yeah, motor nerve problems cause big issues and motor nerves have a specific start and end, but sensory nerves are more diffuse and more broad and they're out there in our body seeking things, trying to give feedback to the central nervous system about where we are in space whether we're too hot or too cold, whether we have an injury or not. So these nerves are what are conducting our pain signal from an area of tissue damage, regard, irregardless of what that tissue is, to the central nervous system. Here are the kind of different classifications of pain, if you will. Now the nociceptive pain, that's what I just talked about where you have this tissue injury and it gets carried up this into the dorsal root ganglion, up the spinal thalamic tract into the central nervous system, into the brain versus you can have neuropathic pain where what if the damage is to the nervous system itself? Well, then that's neuropathic. The nerves themselves that carry the pain signals are actually causing the pain and then you can have other type of pain and you can have multiple sources of pain all at the same time the other type of pain that's an area of really interesting research and in fact um i keep up with that but i go back and forth i haven't formed a strong opinion one way or the other but really what i have seen clinically is the other type of pain there usually is a root cause. You just have to work perhaps harder to get to it. And if you do, then you can resolve it. Well, the conventional approach to pain is, okay, the philosophy is pain is bad, so let's take the pain away. Your patient's here because they're in pain, well, let's take their pain away. But the problem is that it results in treating the symptom of pain. It doesn't necessitate, necessitate taking care of the root cause of the pain. Why is the pain there to begin with? That should be the question that everybody is asking when a patient comes in with that complaint. Well, what has happened is when we focus on treating the symptom of pain, we throw things at it and we just try to manage the symptom. So for instance, one of the first signs of conventional care are to throw medications at the symptom of pain. And we have medicines that can take away pain. They specifically take away pain and those are called analgesics. So you can take those, but the patient is continuing to do what they've been doing. The, the underlying root cause of why they have pain is still there. And so no wonder why, we throw these analgesics and, and we can take away pain, but then all of a sudden these pain medicines don't really work. Why? Because the root cause hasn't been addressed. So then we throw some other medicines at it, like maybe some anti-inflammatories. The problem with anti-inflammatories, one of the problems is that inflammation is a natural process of the body. 
Now, there are times when that inflammation works against us, where that inflammation could be life-threatening, but it is a natural response for how our body heals. And we need to understand that. And the interesting thing is there's some recent studies showing that taking NSAIDs, like the -the over-the-counter ibuprofen, aspirin, Aleve, those kind of anti-inflammatories, taking those after experiencing an acute injury actually delays the healing of that injury and makes it more likely that that acute injury is going to turn into a chronic problem over time because we've interfered with how the body's going to heal. Again, taking those anti-inflammatories will help alleviate the pain for a period of time, but it's not addressing the root cause of the issue. So if we just started by trying to get to the root cause, maybe we could affect a different, have a different outcome. Other medications that are tried because You know, you have patients in the system and, and, and physical therapy and other types of approaches aren't working, but the problem is still persisting and they're still having pain. So then we think, well, it must all be in their head and we give them antidepressants or we give them anti-epileptics and those may help with the symptom of pain to a certain degree. But again, the root cause hasn't been addressed. And we see this perpetual cycle of patients not getting well when they have these chronic pains. Then we reach a point where, okay, we've had chronic pain, maybe even to a point of disability now, we've tried all these non-aggressive, non-invasive things. We need to step it up because we need to get this person back to feeling better, back to being a participant in society. Well, what are we gonna do? Well, perhaps we can do some injection therapies so non-surgical interventions, or perhaps we may need to do surgery. I'll show you kind of an example of some of the non-surgical interventions. Now, the non-surgical interventions are not always about injections, but they usually involve needles. (laughs) So here's a, a diagram of a vertebral body and segment in the spinal cord, and we have the nerve roots going out the foramen, and this is just showing a needle as it would be used to do a uh, inner laminar epidural injection of corticosteroids. And this is a different approach here where we are um, injecting transframily around that nerve root. But anyway, um, much like um, using oral anti-inflammatories like NSAIDs, injecting corticosteroids into tissues isn't without a problem. So It can help relieve inflammation, but it's treating the symptom of pain. It's not addressing the root cause of why the injury is there to begin with or helping the tissues to heal. And so what we see is that those steroids have diminishing return. The more you use them on a patient, uh, the less effective they become, the less duration, and then all the while, the underlying root cause is getting worse and worse and worse. So patients that have cortisone injections are on for their pain management just tend to get worse and worse and worse with time. Some of the other things that can be done conventionally are things like radiofrequency ablation. So yes, we're smart. We know that the nerves are what carry the signal. And we do know that some of the sensory nerves, they don't have any motor effect, can, um, if we were to take them offline, then they would no longer provide the pain signal, but um, the under, and we can leave the tissues as they are. So here's an example of something that we do. It's called geniculate nerve radiofrequency ablation. So somebody that has knee pain, let's say they have really severe knee osteoarthritis, but they're not a good surgical candidate because they have diabetes or heart disease or sleep apnea and, or all of them. And so the surgeon elects, well, I don't want to do surgery too high of a risk, but they have severe osteoarthritis, not much we can do. Well, why don't we burn these sensory nerves so that the pain signal from the knee doesn't get into that spinal thalamic tract and into the nervous system? But what we're doing there is obviously treating the symptom, destructing the nerves, and not helping the actual place where the tissue issue is. What happens though, and this is pretty amazing, is that our nerves grow back, right? Some 
Um, some textbooks, I think most of them have caught up to the fact to know, but when I started out, I won't tell you how long, in undergrad, uh, the textbook said that, you know, nerve t nervous tissue doesn't really regenerate. Well, it does. How do we know that? Because we burn these nerves, and then about six to nine months later, the patient's pain comes back. Why? The nerves have regrown. So then they start sending that pain signal again. So what do we do? We burn them again. And so you're in this cycle of pain relief, pain back, pain relief, pain back, and you're burning these nerves, which can be quite expensive to the medical system, by the way, over and over and over. And you're in this pain management while the whole time, the reason why the patient's pain is there to begin with, the underlying root cause is not being addressed. Here are some other fancy things that can be done. There are other nerves that can be burned. For instance, for low back pain, we have the sinovertebral nerve. And you can insert this little catheter into the disc, intervertebral disc, and ablate that nerve. But what happens? Same thing. That pain signal that, the, that those sensory nerves were sending uh, is interrupted for a period of time, but then the nerve regrows, and then the pain comes back, and then you need to repeat it, and over and over. Another thing that can be done is putting in spinal cord stimulators, where there are these um, electrodes in the spine, and there's this electromagnetic signal that blocks out the chronic pain coming up that spinal thalamic tract, but it does nothing to, to treat what the underlying root cause is. Okay, sorry, I'm just taking a look at the chat, make sure I'm not missing anything there. Okay, good. So then what, what often is the end result of our conventional approach is surgery. And the one of the problems with surgery is that it's not necessarily a definitive fix like we might want it to be. And the, the, the journey of the patients between when they first had their symptoms to when they finally have surgery, there's a lot of suffering that goes on between point A and point B. And ultimately, it's because the root cause wasn't being addressed. On the other hand, now, I'm not saying that the conventional approach and the naturopathic approach are mutually exclusive. They can be one in the same. It's just there's not much incentive from the conventional approach to adopt most of the naturopathic approach. Um, whereas naturopaths, by our oath, by our training, we are kind of bound, implored, compelled to search for that root cause. We'll talk about that a little bit more which is going to result in a different outcome for our patients and for healthcare and for society, I believe. So the naturopathic approach, what does that look like? Well, pain is bad. It doesn't matter of your training. You, we can all agree that pain is bad, but it's there for a reason. So we have to find what that reason is and heal that if we can, or modify it or change it at the root, not just treat the symptoms. And if we can modify or heal or treat that root cause, then the pain will abate. So how can we do this? Well, we can work with the body's own innate healing processes. We can utilize other things um, other than needles and scalpels and medicines and electrodes um, to help our patients feel better, to help tissues to heal. Some of the things that naturopaths will use as in their toolbox to, to help with these things are supplements. So we, we often prescribe supplements, but the um, underlying philosophy of why and which supplement we're prescribing is perhaps quite a bit different than the conventional approach. So if somebody comes in with pain, I want to figure out where what tissue is that source of pain coming from? Is it from a partially torn tendon? Or is it from a degenerative joint that has osteoarthritis? Or is it from uh, appendicitis in their abdomen? Well, I want to determine what that source tissue is. And once I do that, and I order tests and imaging and 
use all the tools that I can to gather as much information as I can. Um, once I have a good understanding of what that might be, the supplement that I'm prescribing is not a supplement to take away the pain. It's not a supplement to treat the symptom. The supplement that I'm prescribing is, and or multiple supplements, are there to try to get that tissue, wherever that pain is coming from, to heal. So for instance, for things like um, tendon or ligament injuries, collagen, type one collagen is what makes up our tendons. And so I will prescribe some collagen and I will prescribe um, these molecules that are called resolvins that are a specific fraction of fish oil that works anti-inflammatory, but not like through a, not like the over-the-counter medications that are just a very high level, broad um, anti-inflammatory. So there's this whole Cox and Lox pathway, Cox 1, Cox 2, and all these different where, places that you can block inflammation. These anti-inflammatories, instead of just broad-based systemically blocking inflammation, these are very specific in actually helping inflammation go from inflammation to resolution. And that's what we want. We don't want to be in this chronic stage of low-grade inflammation. That's signaling to the body that there's still an injury. But what we want is to help the body to get that inflammation where it needs to be so that it can resolve it and heal the tissue. Um, if it's neuropathic pain, there's plenty of vitamins and minerals and, and uh, botanical medicines that can help support the nerve health, not treat pain. There are some things that we can prescribe that do, do help with the pain, but that's not the goal, right? The goal is to address the underlying tissue issue. Also, things like fibromyalgia or these um, issues that where we have not just one injury, but we have this kind of chronic um, diffuse musculoskeletal aches and pains. One of the things to do is why are is to figure out why are all those tissues all at the same time causing those pain? Is it an autoimmune disease? And if so, we can treat that. We have a lot of good approaches to that too. That's where diet and things like that really come into play. But if it's not, and it's not an autoimmune, but they still have this kind of fibromyalgia picture, boy, I like to work really hard on optimizing mitochondrial health because I think that ultimately the reason why those muscles are not doing so good is because their mitochondria are struggling in whatever way. Um, and if we can get the mitochondria firing better, the muscles are going to feel better and the person is going to feel better. Some of the other things that we do as naturopaths are, is use exercise, diet, stress reduction, treat the mental, emotional aspects of a being in order to help them overcome their, their pain. I can't tell you how many people I treat where I need to kind of coax them and um, almost forcefully tell them you need to move, right? Like our bodies are designed to move. We are not designed to be static beings and movement is how our tissues that don't get very good blood flow get nourishment so that they can regenerate, have cell turnover and heal. So tissues that are well vascularized, they have the plasma there, they have platelets, they have everything that they need readily available for them to turn over and to heal and to metabolize. Yet issues like intervertebral discs in our spine, uh, tendon, ligament, they are meant to be very strong. And if they were vascular, they would have perforations in them and they'd be weaker. So the body is designed to sacrifice vascularity and hence healing potential so that they can have strength. But with that, um, they don't always heal so well. So we're, but by moving these areas, you can get flow, you can um, get the tenocytes or the ligaments, the fibroblasts to get to the areas that need to be healed. One interesting study that came out recently, uh, I say recently, probably about a year and a half ago though, um, was this real definitive piece because there's always been a question of, okay, I have pain and it hurts when I move, is moving causing more damage to the tissue? And 
unequivocally, this study showed that for multiple conditions, whether it be low back pain or elbow pain, golfer's elbow, neck pain, all these area, different chief complaints of areas of where their bodies were having pain, people that continue to exercise and exercise vigorously actually had better outcomes than the people who stopped moving because you need that exercise movement in order to get to get that flow, to get that healing, to get that vitality where it needs to be to help your body's natural ability to regenerate. As far as interventions, so not depending on the state, there's different scope of practices that the naturopathic doctors that we can, um, the level of intervention that we can do, but we are trained in interventions. We are trained in minor surgery and we are trained in doing injections. So we're not doing like orthopedic surgery but we can do minor surgery and non-surgical injections. We're also trained in physical medicine and manipulation, similar to what um, you might expect a chiropractic doctor to be trained in. And again, the philosophy there is motion is lotion, get things moving that they can heal and feel better. Um, my specific training was first diagnosis and then intervention in the interventions that I use along with all these other areas of support are injection therapies. So again, I, I think I kind of have hammered this home, but we'll, we'll use an analogy to help. So if we can kind of take a comparison between a car and our body, right? A car, if the frame gets severed or um, broken or dented, there's nothing in the car uh, in and of itself that can fix that break, tear, dent. But our bones might be akin to what the frame is to a car. If we break a bone, yes, to a certain degree, if it's broken so bad, then the body, that's too much for the body to overcome. But for the majority of the cases, most people um, are non traumatic and not severe, um, you break a bone, you give it some time, and what happens? Your osteoblast and osteoclast and everything, your vitamin D, and everything works in conjunction with our um, innate feeling, our innate healing, and so the bone can heal. You don't need to do anything. Sure, if it's completely shattered, you might need a surgery and surgeon, but in general, our body does not need an exogenous input in order for it to heal. Our wiring system. So you can kind of think of like a car. If it has to send impulses from one place to another in order to accomplish the task that a car is meant to do. Turn the steering wheel, push the brakes, things like that. Turn on the blinkers. If one of those cords or wires is shorted or severed or damaged in any way, what happens? The car can't fix it itself. The car has to go to a mechanic or electrician and get fixed that way. In our bodies, I've already talked about the radio frequency ablation of the geniculate nerves. We know that our nerves can grow back. Now, there is a point of damage where our nerves and certain diseases where our nerves won't grow back. But for the most part, and for most of healthcare that we see, at least in a primary care setting, setting non-hospital, non-trauma setting, um, and the reasons why people have most of the disability and long-term disability in our country are things that are not so severe, right? And so these nerves can heal. They can adapt. Our body is designed to heal these tissues. Um, the combustion system, the gas, and, and everything going around, that could be akin to our digestive system. Again, if you have a kink in the chain or a leak or something like that um, in the car, you need to go see a mechanic. In our bodies, depending on how severe, um, the body can, if we can support it and, and do it safely, might be able to regenerate and heal itself. Similarly, like the motor might be analogous to our heart. Our heart is so much more than a pump. I know you all know that, but um, in a car, if something goes wrong here, you have to go to your mechanic or get a new motor. In our heart, there's a 
it is designed to heal and regenerative medicine and cardiology is really picking up steam right now too. So in general, the naturopathic approach is treating the body as it is, trying to understand and harness the fact and the knowledge that we understand our physiology. We understand what the body's trying to do and we're trying to support and work with that to accomplish a task. Yes, there may be a time and a place and there always will be for surgeons, but there's a big gap between, especially in pain, between those who have new onsets of pain, years and years of suffering, and then finally they do a surgery as a last resort. There's a lot of people that we can help in the middle there if we understand how the body works and we try to treat the root cause of that issue, then I think we can change healthcare. So just to hammer at home, another point um, about our bodies being able to heal. And, and this is something that I learned in my training at St. John's College in philosophy. And this was one of the pieces of the puzzle that led me towards naturopathic medicine as well. And I love it that I get a read this quote quite often and use it, implement it, put it into practice every day when I'm in clinic. So it goes, but, but metabolism is more than a method of power generation. Or food is more than fuel. In addition to, and more basic than, providing kinetic energy for the running of a machine. Its role is to build up originally and replace continually the very parts of the machine. Metabolism, thus, is the constant becoming of the machine itself, and this becoming itself is a performance of the machine. But for such a performance, there is no analog in the world of machines. So the point being, even though we try to treat the body as machine, as even though that we try to break it down redu reductionistically so it's easier to understand into different discrete parts, our bodies are different than a machine fundamentally because we have metabolism, because we can endogenously replace our tissues continually over time and we are designed to do so. Here's an example that's well-documented uh, about that. When we get a cut, what happens? We go through this healing cascade. First, and what happens is we get hemostasis. We have to stop the bleeding. Well, you don't need uh, an, an exogenous for certain types of bleeding. Uh, you don't need an exogenous influence for the body to stop that. Our platelets are designed to form a plug and form a clot, stop that bleeding. Not only do those platelets stop that bleeding, but then they re release these growth factors. And these growth factors start this acute inflammatory phase. That's where an injury is painful. Those platelets then, through their signaling, even though the plug, the platelet plug is long gone, the cascade of events that they have triggered starts this proliferative phase where these fibroblasts put down um, collagen and, and other things like vascular tissue and muscle tissue and skin. And then we get the remodeling where these tissues turn back into their no more normal and strong self. And so we've known this for quite a long time, and we know this in particular in surgery for wound healing, but it doesn't just happen in the skin after a laceration. This happens in all of our tissues all of the time, let alone our body's natural turnover. So why don't we work with this instead of against it? What can happen with healthcare? Well, perhaps we can change it. So long-winded, but here's the summary for, of the naturopathic approach. Pain is there for a reason. If we find the reason, then we can really affect change for that person and change the trajectory that they are on. We're gonna work with the body's innate capacity to heal. We're gonna take, and another thing that we can do is we can take healthy tissue from one area of the body and administer it to another area of the body in order to get that area to heal. And that's what I'm particularly passionate about and what I do. And so what that looks like and what that is generally termed is regenerative medicine, where we are working with the body's innate capacity to heal, but we know that in certain tissues, there are different types of cells at different types of concentrations and different tissues perform different functions. Well, if we can harness 
part of the tissue that is meant to heal tendon and ligament and put it into a tendon and ligament that has been partially torn or is chronically injured or causing patient's dysfunction, then maybe that transplant of that vital force of that um, healing capacity can get that area of tissue damage to heal once and for all. So that is the goal of regenerative medicine. The goal of regenerative medicine is not to cut things out, not to um, burn nerves or any of that, but to relieve pain by healing the tissue that is damaged. In our low back, low back pain is the number one cause of disability in our country, and it's the number one chronic complaint. Well, we know a lot about what causes the low back pain, but most of the treatments are directed at the symptom of pain. If we actually treat the disc disease or the underlying facet joint arthritis or whatever else it may be about the nerve root impingement, things like that, then if we can heal those tissues, it's going to change the landscape of medicine. And there are people like our clinic that are doing that. So regenerative medicine does employ the core naturopathic tendons. As naturopaths, we take an oath um, where we are understand and use these principles to treat our patients. So this medic, medic, medicatrix naturae, this is the healing power of nature. That's what we're working with as naturopaths and in regenerative medicine. Docere, doctor is teacher. For regenerative, regenerative medicine to work and to get a good outcome, we really need to do a good job of explaining to patients what to expect. It's gonna get worse before it gets better. That's how the body heals. We know that. So um, don't run off to surgery just because it got worse for a couple of weeks before it gets better. Address the root cause. Well, we've already covered that one. Treat the whole person. That's important too, because a lot of the times um, a hip injury isn't just isolated to the hip or a, a tendon or ligament injury isn't just isolated to the one tendon or ligament that is torn. It may be susceptible to injury from other influencing factors. And so we need to figure those out and treat those as well. And that's an example of treating the whole person. Prevention. By doing these treatments, by, by um, healing a tissue, we are preventing further damage to that tissue. We are preventing excess cost to the healthcare system and so many other things. We're restoring active, healthy lives, vital members of society, and then do no harm. Well, the nice thing about regenerative medicine is if it doesn't work for a particular patient, there's no irreversible damage. We haven't removed any tissue. We haven't fundamentally changed their bodies in a negative way by any means. So um, just a plug about what regenerative medicine can look like in the real world. It's not so simple. Um, and that's a whole nother lecture in upon itself. But what ultimately what we're going for is this excellent outcome. And to get there, to get that tissue healing or to get that patient feeling better and moving better and living better, what we need to do, we need to find the diagnosis, precise yet complete, as in treating the whole person and treating the root cause. We have to choose the right type of medicine to put into that tissue in order to give it a chance to heal. And then we have to deliver it precisely into that tissue. Here's a case example of that. And okay, got a perfect amount of time to go through this. So here's a real common complaint that I see and that anybody that's in medicine in a kind of primary care setting will see is lateral elbow pain. So I had a 52 year old male came to clinic with right lateral elbow pain. He had to kind of come and go and come and go um, over time, but this most current episode started eight months ago, but it had failed to respond to the other types of therapies that in the past had taken care of it. So he had tried the anti-inflammatories, ice, heat, kinesio taping, physical therapy. There was no specific injury, yet um, the patient does use clippers for his job. He owns a vineyard and he's out in the fields. Pain seven out of 10, interfering with work, wakes him up from sleep, really, um, he was just kind of at its wit's end. No significant comorbidities or chronic medical conditions, only one medication that didn't really have any significance in this case. 
the patient had been dealing with this for eight months and had seen other doctors, but nobody had thought to actually try to take a look at what might be going on. They just threw medications at it and exercises. Well, I took a look and down here in these images um, is an example of um, what a tendon, bone, and other tissues can look like on diagnostic ultrasound. So the image on the left is his left elbow. Um, there's two bones there. We have the epicondyle here, the lateral epicondyle of the humerus, and then we have the radius here. And there's this tendon sweeping through here, and that's called the common extensor tendon. So the left side, those tendon fibers are nice and intact and have this normal collagen pattern and normal thickness. And that side is not the side that's painful. It's his right side that's painful. When we take a look at the right side, we look and we see the bones and those look fine and good and in normal alignment and no significant osteoarthritis. But what we see is that pattern of the tendon coming in and inserting on the bone, we see some holes in it. There's one here, one here, one here, one here. There's four discrete partial tears. And in combination, those par partial tears equate to a high grade partial tear. Now that's not your run of the mill, a lateral epicondylitis. This is actual partial tears. Lateral epicondylitis would be the tendon is still intact, but it's just inflamed and thickened. Here we actually have tears and those tears generally aren't gonna heal on its own. So I talked through the conventional approach to treatment like corticosteroid injections and other options versus my approach to treatment and what I thought would be best for the patient. And luckily the patient elected for choosing a regenerative medicine type of therapy. And so what I did was um, drew some blood from him that blood went to the lab and was spun down and we created a product called platelet rich plasma. I also harvested, harvested some adipose tissue from his love handles and adipose is fat. And I specifically targeted that tissue for a reason. And the reason is I wanted to inject it into those partial tears so that it would fill them in. And one of the advantages of adipose tissue, not only is it very, um, like a bio scaffold or biologic glue, but also it has cells in it that can differentiate into tendon ligament bone. So if we put it into a tendon, then not only can it fill in that partial tear, but it can turn into a nice normal and heal that tendon. So what we see is the original scan. And then here is a scan of uh, this was six months later. You can see that even though he's using his arm and he's pain-free, the adipose graft, this bright area filling in where those tears were, is still there. And it looks still kind of like adipose tissue. Adipose tissue on the ultrasound is very bright. But then a year later, after we had done the injection, patient is still doing great and asymptomatic. I take another scan and we look at that same tendon and not only is the adipose gone, but the partial tears have healed. So that's what we're going for with, with regenerative medicine. If, if we don't use that naturopathic approach that trying to heal the root cause and finding the root cause that he could have been suffering for more and more time or, and, and ultimately ended up at surgery for something that we could heal, that we could work and harness the body's innate healing capacity. Here's Dr. another case. Dr. Manning, um, just a heads up, there are two minutes left to the webinar. Great, thank you. I'm getting carried away here, but uh, I skipped another case that was of a tendon. We're gonna get to a real interesting case here and then we'll, we'll wrap it up for sure. So this was a 31 year old female runner with knee pain. Um, here's what her MRI showed prior to the procedure. She has an osteochondral defect under in the cartilage underneath her patella. And so there's a hole right here in her patella, uh, the cartilage under her patella, the hole right here. This is normal cartilage. This is normal cartilage. There's the hole. You can see that same hole from the side. So normal cartilage, normal cartilage hole. Well, I treated her with the same type of mixture of adipose tissue and platelets. And lo and behold, 18 months after the treatment, she is asymptomatic and feeling great. She came in for a different reason. I thought, well, let's just take a look at the knee anyway. 
we see here that that hole in the cartilage has fully filled in with more cartilage. And you can see it here and you can see it here. So we can actually regrow cartilage. And if you look at the textbooks, they say that's not possible without doing surgery or putting in other types of graft. We, I just did a knee injection. Now you have to get in the right spot and you have to use the right type of medicine, but our bodies can heal. We can work with them to heal. Naturopaths are trained on how to do that. And these are the types of results we can get. Um, in summary, I, I love naturopathic medicine. I think our future is bright. I think um, naturopathic medicine is never going away because our underlying philosophy is always going to be proven right. It is always going to work towards healing. And if we work towards healing using that philosophy and we stick to that philosophy, we're going to treat people well and we're going to get good outcomes. I do think that if you um, choose to become a naturopath, I hope you do, that you consider postgraduate training. It's very important. And here are my socials. Thank you. Dr. Manning, thank you so very much. Can you just uh, go to the next slide quickly so we can announce the upcoming events? So uh, real quickly, I know we're over time here. Uh, we have the uh, immediate past president from the Naturopathic Student Association, very recent graduate, Dr. Mickey Bronner. I think he graduated a few weeks ago. Uh, he will be presenting uh, tips and tricks from a naturopathic student and ways to navigate med school. Uh, we ho have Dr. Greenberg for September talking about acne and autoimmune conditions in October. So I hope to see you at a future event. And thank you so very much. This recording will be posted to our events archive in the next couple of days. Thanks for joining. And thank you, Dr. Manning, for, for your time and, and brain space today. I really appreciate you. Thank you.